Hi there, everyone. Welcome again to our study on God's providence. Uh, thank you for joining me. Uh, so we're at lesson number five of our series on God's providence. Uh, so far, just a quickly recap. So far, we've considered God's general providence and special providence. General referring to his general governance and upholding of all creation. And special providence referring to his particular care for his people. On top of that, we have not only considered the importance of meditating upon God's providence, but the last lesson we looked at how we can meditate upon God's providence. In the next couple of lessons, I want to put something of that into practice. What I mean is this, uh, for the next few weeks, I want us to meditate together, particularly on God's dark providences, on those afflictive providences. Um, but before I Get, get carried away. Uh, before I say anything else, perhaps we should open up with a word of prayer, uh, seeking just the Lord's guidance and His grace to instruct us as we consider this important topic. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and goodness. We thank you that you are our God. You have made us in your image, but especially we thank you that you have remade us in the image of Christ. You're busy remaking us in His image. You have purchased us with the precious blood of the Lamb. You have made us your own. You have justified us, accepted us. You have set us apart as your children. You have given us great and bountiful blessings in your Son. And so as we come to consider uh, something of your providence, especially your dark providences, we pray that you would give us grace. Uh, we know that, dear Lord, you are in control even of the difficult things in life. But we pray that you would give us the faith and the perseverance patience to submit ourselves to you so that we would walk aright before you that we would be a people pleasing before you especially in the days in which we live dear lord we ask that you would impress upon our hearts uh, this lesson uh, the doctrine and the beauty of this doctrine of god's providence of your providence bless us and encourage us guide us and lead us in christ's name amen so as i've mentioned i want to look at uh, what people have called God's dark providences or afflictive providences. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, I mean those things in life that make life, quite frankly, unpleasant. Difficulties, trial, afflictions, trouble. And when it comes to uh, our own walk with the Lord, the things we often struggle the most with is the dark providences. These are the things that often... Uh, cause frustration that often lead us to to react in unbelieving ways that often cause us to sin and so it's very important for us i believe that we consider dark providences that we recognize that they are reality in our lives and that we recognize that god has called upon us to to act a particular way in light of these dark providences and so just for simplicity's sake, I'm going to use dark providences and afflictions quite synonymously in uh, this series. Uh, again, because I think afflictions are pretty much a broad term. But let's quickly consider just the ex extent of afflictions that we face. We need to recognize that afflictions will touch us in every area of our life. In nature, uh, in terms of our body, our, 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 our physical life, often there are afflictions there. Often many people struggle with uh, certain conditions or certain ailments that aren't because of sin or anything, but just because of that's an ailment that they have. An example of this is Sarah's bar barrenness in Genesis 11.13. That wasn't because of any sin on her part, but just because of God's wisdom, he allowed her to be barren. And so sometimes we have these physical, natural ailments and afflictions that often are quite distressing. They often cause a lot of difficulty, these conditions, sicknesses or diseases. Think even of the blind man in the Gospels who was born blind, not because of any sin on his part or his parents' part, just a natural affliction. And sometimes we deal with those things. We deal with these struggles, those afflictions. We also deal with afflictions, afflictions in terms of honor, in terms of how we relate to others, in terms of reputation. Often we are uh, despised and rejected, especially as Christians. Uh, an example of this would be the faithful saints uh, mentioned in Hebrews 11. Uh, men who are devoted to God, faithful to God, yet who are despised, who are rejected by others, who are persecuted and martyred. 
And some oftentimes we are, by God's providences, uh, we are treated in that way. Whether it is as a Christian or any other reason, we are despised. And sometimes those are often sources of great discouragement when our reputation is slandered, when people attack us. Uh, so we, that, that's a source of affliction. Or even, especially, I think, in our vocation, how often do we not have difficulties in work? And these are difficult. When, when we fight with bosses and we uh, have disagreements with, with fellow colleagues, these are great sources of discouragement. Uh, perhaps you have a boss that's just unbearable or, or a, a conflict that's ar arisen. And so even in, in vocation, in our vocation, we see this. Uh, Jeremiah is a classic example, called by the Lord to the office of a prophet. Yet he was the weeping prophet, uh, didn't experience much joy in his vocation as a prophet. And sometimes God allows that. Sometimes God puts us at a work where there is affliction. Well, what about relational affliction in relationships where there tension or conflict or strife? Isn't that one of the biggest sources of our afflictions? When we, when we uh, fight with friends or family or, or colleagues, again, uh, these are great sources of affliction, uh, causing great discouragement. And perhaps even when we've experienced loss, when we've lost a loved one, when we've lost someone who was dear to us, that often causes a great uh, burden and, and a great discouragement in our hearts. And so we could add to this, there are various areas in which afflictions touch us. And that's my point I want to get across, that affliction will touch you in every area of your life. You cannot avoid the reality of trouble. You cannot avoid the reality of dark providences in this life. And the quicker we come to recognize that, I think, the better. And the better we will be prepared to bear these afflictions. And so let us take note of that, and a few passages will help us and just remind us of the reality of affliction. Job 4, 14, verse 1, man who is born of woman is few of days and full of trouble. See, trouble is to be expected. Uh, do not be surprised when afflictions happen, when uh, afflictions occur. No, be expectant of it. Our days are full of trouble. Jesus himself said this in Matthew 6.34. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. That is to say, every day will have its trouble. Uh, so let us be aware of it. Let us be expectant of us. We cannot avoid dark, God's dark providences. We cannot avoid affliction. But the question then becomes, if we cannot avoid it, how do we cope with it? That's the big question that I want to deal with in the next couple of weeks in terms of God's dark providences. How can I, how can you cope under the real reality of affliction? How do we survive the dark providences? How do we survive tension at work? How do we survive tension in family? How do we survive the loss of a loved one? How do we survive sickness and, and disease? How do we cope with these things? How do we cope and, and bear the weight of affliction? And see, this is why this question matters, because these are things that trouble us, if we're honest. And so in light of that question, I want to spend the next few weeks by answering that question with three words. And those three words are patience, perseverance, and profit. That is to say, if we want to bear the weight of affliction, we need to be a people who resolve to be patient in affliction. We need to be a people who resolve to persevere through affliction. And we need to be a people who in affliction set our minds and resolve to see the profit of affliction. And so what I want to do in the next couple of weeks is look on these uh, particular uh, aspects of bearing affliction. And, and this morning or this in this lesson, I want to look particularly at uh, this call to be patient. 
But before I even get there, where do I get the idea of these three things? Where do I get this idea of patience, perseverance, and profit? Or another way to say that, if you don't like the P's, uh, is, is we are called to be a people of faith, a people of faithfulness in perseverance, and a people who look for the fruit of affliction. Whichever way you go for it, where do I get the idea of these three things? Well, the text I get, I draw these concepts from is James chapter 5, verse 7 and 11. Uh, this passage is really taken up with this idea of patience in suffering. And so I want to read this passage for you. And I hope you see something of where I'm getting these concepts from. And I hope you see how important these three things are in bearing affliction, in bearing and coping with trials in life. Listen to what James says, James chapter 5, verse 7 to 11. He says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. So there you get your first idea, right? Uh, the idea of patience. Now, what does patience look like according to James? Well, James helps us. He carries on and he gives us this illustration. He says, See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. Pause right there. There you see this idea of fruitfulness, of profit. There's profit in waiting, in being patient. So see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. And then he says in verse 8, You also, therefore, be patient. Establish your hearts. What a good description that is of faith. Uh, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. In verse 10 he says, As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. That's the way I get this idea of perseverance. Uh, perseverance follows on from patience. Patience isn't this... Uh, Passive thing. It includes this idea of patiently persevering through. But we see that idea there. We are called to, to uh, remain steadfast. James carries on. He says, you have heard of the steadfastness of Job. And you have seen the purpose of the Lord. Again, God has perfect purpose. There is a profit in affliction. And, the, and then he concludes uh, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. So that's where I get these three ideas from. James here is telling us, essentially, is that we need to be a people, and James is making the case that we need to be a people who are patient, but not just patient in affliction, but those who persevere. Those who persevere. Why? Because there is great profit. There is great fruitfulness in this affliction. But we need to, to enjoy that profit, to enjoy that fruitfulness. We need to be a people who are patient in perseverance. So that's what I think James is calling upon us. And I think that's what we need to get settled in our own hearts as we bear the weight of affliction. And so in this lesson, uh, I wish I could cover them all in one lesson, but we might be here for too long. But for this lesson, I want to look at the first aspect of bearing the weight of affliction. And that is this call that we need to resolve to be patient in affliction. We need to be a people of patience, not unbelief, not murmuring, not fretful and anxious, but really a people who are patient in affliction. And I think the, the scriptures speak very clearly to this, and I'm sure you would agree. Psalm 27 verse 14, David here says, wait for the Lord, be strong, let your heart take courage, wait for the Lord. See, in Psalm 27, David is recording how he is surrounded by enemies. He's surrounded by foes who want to end his life, who want to uh, persecute him. But on top of that, not only is David surrounded by, by enemies, David has a burning desire for God. He desires to long to see God's face, to be in God's temple. So based upon those two things, what does David resolve to do? Well, David resolves to wait upon the Lord. He doesn't try to do things his own way. He doesn't get angry with God because of these enemies. He doesn't uh, even get despondent because he isn't at the place of worship. 
No, David resolves to wait. David resolves to be patient, to say it another way. And this is something that David himself actually exhorts others to do. In Psalm 37, verse 7, David says, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil desires. See, David is reflecting upon the prosperity of evildoers and the wicked. And what does David resolve to do? He resolves and he commands others to resolve this, to be patient, to be still and wait upon the Lord. And so we need to see the importance of this. If David, the man after God's own heart, was characterized by this patient waiting upon the Lord, should we not desire this? And I think there's great great benefit in this patience. There's great benefit in, in, in patiently waiting upon the Lord. Consider a few passages. Isaiah 40 verse 31. What a wonderful passage this is. Look, look at what it says. They who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with the wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. It shows us something of the benefit of waiting upon the Lord, right? See, those who wait upon the Lord, they find renewal. They find strength. Why? Because they're waiting upon God. They're depending upon Him. And He is not a God who grows faint or grows weary. Rather, He is a God who is strong, almighty, and who upholds His people. And what benefit there is when we wait upon the Lord in affliction. We don't go ahead on ourselves. We simply wait. And what another encouragement this is, Isaiah 49 verse 23, those who wait for me shall not be put to shame. Those who wait for the Lord, that is to say, they will not be put to shame, but to the contrary, they will be honored. And the context seems to suggest that who is the one honoring? It is God. And I believe we need to realize that God honors people who wait upon him. This reveals something that God delights in it when His people turn to Him. And those who turn to Him, those who wait upon Him, He honors. And I think it ties to this whole aspect of humility. And humility is quite important when we come to discuss uh, providence. And perhaps later on we'll look more at humility. But what does God do to the humble? Well, God throughout Scripture emphasizes the point that He exalts the humble. And so the point for us to take is this, in affliction, in these dark providences that weigh heavy upon us, we need to be those people who, who wait upon the Lord, who humble ourselves under those afflictions, who submit to God with patient waitfulness, if that's even a word. But we need to wait upon the Lord. Now, we often struggle with it, I realize, and I see it in my own life. We struggle with this idea of patience. Patience is often not a virtue that I have and perhaps you as well. And we need to recognize a few problems or objections. And, and this is where I found Thomas Boston quite helpful because he brings across two objections that people typically have to this idea of waiting upon God. One objection that people have is this, it's hopeless. This affliction will never be taken away. So instead of waiting upon God, instead of patiently waiting and enduring affliction, people become hopeless. They, they say something like this. This always happens to me. There's always something that goes wrong. I always struggle. I can never catch a break. And so people in the light of dark providences, in the light of affliction, almost become hopeless. In affliction, they don't wait upon God. They, they rather murmur. They, they become discontent. They become discouraged. They become hopeless. And Boston responds and he says, This is the language of unbelieving haste, which faith and patience should correct. How often is it not true of us that in the weight of affliction, we become so discouraged, we become so despondent. But Boston is saying, don't do that. Don't respond in that way. Don't become all hopeless that life is ruined because of this affliction, because of this dark providence. No, this dark providence is there to draw you to God, to wait upon Him. 
Don't fall into unbelief haste. That is what Boston is saying. And we see something of this in Scripture, don't we? We see it in the example of the man of faith, Abraham. In Romans chapter 4, Paul records uh, this of Abraham, of his faith, and how he is to, com- to be commended for faith like this. And if we would have faith like this, we would be commended before the Lord. That's what says, Paul says, Romans 4.19. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. See, for I, for Abraham, it must have seemed the, the it must have seemed overwhelming. His age, the barrenness of of Sarah's womb, it might have seemed impossible. It might have seemed hopeless. Yet, what was the unique thing about Abraham? He believed the Lord. He did not waver in his faith. And so, we too mustn't think that the situation is hopeless. That the affliction is impossible. We mustn't think, we mustn't fall into this, but we must become a people of faith. Boston raises another objection uh, that often is, I think, seen in us at times. He says, often the objection is, but I've I've asked repeatedly without answer. So so perhaps we've been under affliction and, and we've been a people of prayer and we ask God, God, remove this affliction, remove this dark providence, remove that person out of my life, remove this difficulty. And, and he doesn't. And one of the problems that we do is we give up. How often when afflictions aren't removed, how often isn't it true or isn't it the case that we end up, stop praying, we, we stop seeking God's face. We, we stop praying about that affliction. We stop praying about uh, relief from this affliction. And we settle in that despondent unbelief. We settle in that discouragement. And Boston responds and he says, Delays are not denials of prayer in the courts of heaven, but trials of faith and patience of the petitioner. And he's saying, God often does not answer our prayers immediately because he's got a purpose for it. But what we must do, we must not be a people who now in affliction give up. Who who think think that the situation is too great for us or far beyond relief. And and what that actually reveals, when when we settle in this discouragement, when we settle in this despondency, when we become okay with being discouraged, I, I think we're actually sinning against God. God has called upon us to rejoice at all times. And when we have fallen into this hopeless despondency where we no longer seek God's relief in prayer, what we do is we're doubting God's efficiency and we're doubting God's promises. And so let us not be a people like that. I think that's what Boston is is trying to implore us to. Romans 12, 9. Romans 12, verse 12, I think is important and appropriate at this point. We need to rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, and be constant in prayer. And I think those three things need to go together. There needs to be a rejoicing. There needs to be a rejoicing because our hope isn't in our circumstances. It's not in ourselves. It's in our God. But there also needs to be patience in tribulation. But how exactly does that patience endure? How do we grow in that patience? Well, I think... It is through prayer. I think it's uh, not insignificant that Paul there highlights prayer. And that prayer is often associated with those in affliction. With those who are anxious about things. Think of passages like uh, Philippians 4 verse 6. Where Paul says, uh, uh, do not be anxious but with prayer and supplication make your requests made known to God. And so we need to be a people of prayer. But when we fail to pray, there are three dangers that we fall into when we fail to pray. And I want to quickly draw them out for us this evening. When we fail to pray, pray, we behave in unbelief. I think that's clear of what Boston said and hopefully I've communicated already. When When we fail to pray, that is actually a mark of unbelief. 
that is a mark of us saying, okay, well, I can figure this out on my own. Or I can't figure this out, but God can't figure it out, so let me just not pray. No, when we fail to pray, it is a mark of unbelief. And let us not be like that. Let us not be a people of unbelief. Stephen Charnock, he, 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 he pushes this point. He says, the seeking of God should be the prologue of all our affairs. They used to say, in everything we do, we need to seek God's face. We need to seek Him in prayer. The reason, and he carries on, the reason we miscarry the, is because we consult not God, but determine without Him. And then we have no reason to complain of him for not prospering our way when we never commend our affairs to his conduct. What he's saying is this, when we fail to pray, we are not trusting God and we are not looking to him to prosper us. And so that we have no leg to stand on when God doesn't answer prayer because we haven't prayed. And so the point is this, we need to be a people of prayer. We need to seek God's face in prayer. When we fail to pray, we are acting in unbelief. But secondly, when we fail to pray, we are actually missing out on God's works. We're missing out on what God is doing. And Thomas Boston makes this important observation. He says, if removal of afflictions come, while we have dropped our prayer, there will be little comfort when there, remo- when there is a removal of affliction. What he's saying is this. If we stop praying and God decides to remove that affliction, we will actually miss out on the joy of having recognized the answer to prayer. Have, haven't we often experienced that? I've seen it in my own life where I've prayed something. I've, I've asked God for a particular thing and I've stopped praying only to realize months or, or, or years later, wait, God has answered that prayer. But I wasn't thankful in that moment when he answered that prayer. Why? Because I wasn't mindful of it. I stopped praying for it. And see, when you commit yourself to prayer, you are preparing your heart for greater joy, greater joy in the Lord. And so we need to be a people of prayer. Boston even goes on later and he says, even if we are in affliction and God doesn't remove that affliction, let's say you're in a dark providence, you, you have difficulty in a particular situation, God decides not to work and remove that affliction, does that mean you need to stop praying? No, he says you must continue praying. Why? Because this continual prayerfulness evidences your faith And it also draws you closer to God. This brings me to another reason uh, why we, if we fail to pray, uh, is this, if we fail to pray, we ultimately displease God. We know, of course, that God has told us to pray without ceasing. We know that God has told us to be constant in prayer. So if we don't pray, we are displeasing to Him in that way. But there's another way I want to suggest to you that we are displeasing to God when we don't pray. And that is this, when we don't pray, we are actually not allowing God to do something that He wants to do. Listen to this passage. Let me explain it with this passage. Look at this beautiful passage, Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18. Look at what he says, Therefore the Lord waits to be gracious to you, and therefore He exalts Himself to show you mercy, for the Lord is a God of justice, Blessed are all those who wait for him. What a wonderful passage. That passage is saying this. Not only must we wait for God in patience, but God is waiting for us. He's waiting for us so that he can be gracious to us. He wants to be used by us. He wants us to seek his face so that he can lavish us with his mercies. That he can bless us. See, God loves to be called upon by his people. Listen to what Psalm 51 verse 15 says. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and and you shall glorify me. If you're in a dark providence at this moment. If you're under tremendous affliction. If you're wondering where to turn. Turn to God. Don't give up in prayer. Don't give up waiting upon the Lord because He wants you to turn to Him so that He could lavish you with His graces. I love that thought. The God who calls upon us to wait upon Him is waiting upon us so that He would be gracious to us. 
Beloved, I hope that encourages you in your affliction. To know that there is a God who bestows upon you dark providences so that you would be drawn to Him and drink of His graces and His blessings. Blessed are all those who wait for Him because they get the blessed God. And this is what led uh, Stephen Charnock to say this. I love this quote. It is a part of our blessedness to wait for God since it is a part of God's kindness to wait for a fit season to be gracious to us. It is part of our blessedness to wait upon God. As we wait upon God, God fills us with His blessing, with His graces, because He is such a God that in the dark providences and afflictions, He wants to avail Himself to us. And so let us be patient in affliction. How do we bear burdens? How do we bear the affliction or the burden of affliction and dark providences? We need to bear it with much patience. Patience that is characterized by faith, not unbelief, and prayer. And so, beloved, I want to encourage you in your afflictions, uh, in light of the dark providences, wait upon the Lord. Give yourself to wait patiently upon Him in prayer and faith, knowing that as we depend upon Him, He is glorified as He meets us in our need. I want to encourage you to, to think more upon this. And so I've got a few passages there just to make you think about this more and apply it more for your own devotional life. And I trust that would be encouragement to you. And so this is this the end of this lesson. But in the next lesson, we will look at the next aspect of bearing the weight of God's uh, dark providences, particularly how to persevere through those providences. Thank you for joining me, and I trust that this lesson would be encouragement to one and all. Uh, let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you that you are all-seeing and all-knowing and all-powerful God. You're a God who works in mysterious ways, mysterious ways that often confound us and often cause us to wonder of what you're doing. But we thank you, Lord, that we have the assurance that we can wait upon you, knowing that you are good, knowing that you are loving, knowing that you love it when we wait upon you, that we look to you for strength. Dear Lord, help us and forgive us where we have become very angry, we, we've become very anxious, we, we've murmured against you, when we've grumbled against the dark providences. Forgive us for this. Forgive us our unbelief. Forgive us our lack of prayer and help us to be men and women like Abraham, men of faith, women of faith, those who seek your face in all of this. Help us in this. Bestow upon us your grace. Help us to be a people pleasing in your sight. Thank you for this time together. May you be honored. In Christ's name I ask. Amen.